Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church and our contemporary worship service. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and we are grateful to have you join us this morning. As we begin, let us open our hearts and minds and come together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we have gathered once more here in your home and through the gift of technology, we recognize that your spirit not only blesses us but gives us life. It regenerates within us a desire to be the disciples that Christ has called us to be. And so we pray, Lord, that this time with you and with one another will nourish our spirits in a way that gives us all the strength and the courage we need to go back out into the world at the conclusion of our worship and to bless others in your name with acts of mercy and kindness that they might feel the same love and compassion that we have received first from our Lord and Savior. Help us, Lord, to be the best that we can be, for the world needs nothing less, and you deserve all that we are. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able. As we begin with our music this morning, we're going to start with Here I Am to Worship. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this all adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say. You're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to Together worthy, all together. 
psalm for us this morning. Thank you so much. I praise you, God. You are like a marvelous king who wears beautiful, bright robes. You make the water run in rivers 
and the animals come for a drink. You make the plants grow, and we have food to eat. You open your hands and give us everything we need. Thank you so much. Good job. And if there are children who would like to come forward for children's time, you're welcome to come on down. Good morning. Look at this awesome purple bear you've got today. Look, oh, wonderful. Nice. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. How are you, Bo? Oh, bless you. All right. So we're going to be starting a new worship series today, new theme, and our theme is a Christian response, right? So sometimes in our lives, things happen, sometimes in our day, in our houses, things happen, and then you have to decide how you're going to respond, right? What you're going to do, what you're going to say, what you're not going to do, what you're not going to say. So I'm going to tell you a story about something I witnessed in my house, Okay, and the two main characters in this story are my dogs. Okay, one is a beagle named Macaroon, and the other one is a chihuahua named Cholula. Okay, she's a little spicy, that's why her name is Cholula. And so what happened was, it was Saturday, and we were just kind of doing our thing at home, kind of relaxing, because it wasn't a school day, it wasn't a work day, right? We're just kind of chilling out in the morning. And Cholula decided that she didn't like the fact that Macaroon wanted to take a nap. She wanted to play. Have you ever had this where you're ready to play and then other people in your house, maybe your parents or your grandparents or your siblings are not ready to play? Well, Macaroon didn't want to play. Macaroon wanted to nap. And so Cholula went over and she kind of yipped at her a little bit. And she's like, mm, mm, mm. And Macaroon didn't do anything. And so Cholula went over a little bit more and she went, And Macaroon didn't do anything. So finally, she went into Macaroon's bed, and she bit her. Oh. Then Macaroon went, ow! <laughs> Is that how we get what we want? No. no. So then Macaroon was like, all right, you want to play? Fine. So she went over to the basket where we keep the dog toys, and she picked out Cholula's favorite toy. It's a little itty-bitty bunny. It's a little stuffed bunny. She picked it out, and she went and she got on the highest piece of furniture that Cholula couldn't get on and left the bunny there. <laughs> Is that how we respond when we're unhappy? No. 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 That was not a Christian response. That was a very doggy response, right? We need to do better. Cholula was not happy. Uh, it, it, was, it was not a good day yesterday for doggies. There was a lot of time out and time in the crate. So it was not a good day. But again, you can see where things went wrong, right? Cholula wanted to play. Macaroon didn't want to play. Cholula probably needed to go find somebody else to play with, right? Because I'm watching. She could have come and played with me, but she wanted to play with, with Macaroon. And then she bit her. That's not how we respond when we're frustrated, right? Do not bite people. Do not. Never at any point does Jesus bite anybody. Don't bite people. Don't bite dogs. Don't bite anybody. But then when Macaroon was bitten, her response wasn't much better, was it? She, she got vengeful, right? She took Cholula's toy and put it where Cholula couldn't get it. And the worst part was Cholula could see it, but she couldn't get it. And so it was, that wasn't nice, right? That was mean too. And so we could do a lot better, right? We could do a lot better. So when we're confronted by something that we don't like, I want you to remember Cholula and Macaroon, both of whom did not do the Christian thing, <laughs> right? We don't, I should take them to church, right? Oh, that would be really special. Yeah, yeah. On the day we do doggy exorcisms, I'll bring them to church. But yeah, it, it's, that's what we want to try to do better, all right? You think you could do better? The next time it's going on, you'll be like, wait a second, I can't be a macaroon and I can't be a Cholula. I got to be, I got to be me, the best me that I can be. Sound good? good. All right. Yes, you got to be like Jesus. Wonderful. All right. If you would like to go to children's time or children's worship, we're going to invite you to go with our great group over here and they will bring you back after our sermon time. 
All right, gentlemen, good job. It's always great when your animals are helping you get ready for your sermon. <laughs> Fantastic day. Oh. Well, before we hear our scripture this morning, let us once more join together in prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord, it is hard to know what we should do, what we should say, and what we should refrain from doing and saying. And so we turn to you. We look for your example. We look for your guidance and your wisdom. And above all, Lord, we look for your grace. For we know that there will come a time when we have not done as you would have us do. We have not been the people that you would have us be. And yet your love is always for us and your forgiveness ever at the ready. Should we repent of our sin and turn and embrace it, you remind us that your grace is ever available. Help us, Lord, to grow and to turn from that which causes us to sin, which causes pain and suffering for others, and help us to embrace a path that you first trod upon this earth. You showed us the way, Lord. Help us find the courage and the conviction to hold the course. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes to us from the gospel account of Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 through 35. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise Amen. So we're starting a new worship series called A Christian Response, and we'll cover a variety of topics as we pursue this. How do we respond? And this is meant to be an opportunity to look practically at what we are called to do when things happen in our lives. And we're going to start with something that happens. Um, it happens between people. It happens between dogs, as I shared with the children this morning, and that's conflict. Conflict is at its root a disagreement. It means that two people, or often two groups, have come to a point where they cannot quite agree, and so there is a difference there that can cause a rubbing, it can cause a lot of emotional and mental distress, and at its absolute pinnacle of sinfulness, it can cause physical harm. But instead, how do we, as Christians who bear the name of Christ, how do we deal with conflict? And today was a rather long passage, but in it you can see multiple ways that Jesus deals with conflict. Now, he dealt with a lot of conflict. I very carefully chose not to pursue the ones where Jesus is getting snarky with the Pharisees. I don't think that we're all called to be snarky with Pharisees. Instead, I think that it's a practical thing to look at how Jesus dealt with conflict with his disciples with those who were closest to him, with those whom he had been in ministry for three years, those who he was bestowing the keys to the kingdom and telling them to continue to build and gather more in his flock. These are the very people that it is so important for us to focus on because this is who we are. We are the spiritual descendants of those first disciples. And when Jesus is showing us an opportunity how to address something that will happen, if it hasn't happened to you already, just give it some time, you will find conflict. 
And it happens in our homes, it happens with our families, it happens with our friends, it happens in our churches. It happens consistently throughout our lives. It can happen in your schools, it can happen in your jobs, it can happen in your communities, in your neighborhoods. It can happen on public transit. It can happen while you're in your car and someone else is in another car. Conflict can and will happen. Our responsibility is to determine what is the godly way of response to that. And we need to think about it now or else we will simply react, right? And I told the children about my dog yesterday. You could see the frustration building up in my chihuahua. You could see it in her body. And finally, she was like, the only response is to bite her. And that is not the only response. <laughs> that is not. And you know what was really hysterical is that when my chihuahua bit my beagle, and the beagle yelped. The first thing the chihuahua did was go, whoa. Let me get out of the way of that. That's pretty bad. And then she was like, now you're ready to play? That was not the way that we were meant to interact. So Jesus shows us in this passage some incredible things. The first is that it is building upon something that has already been established, something he has worked really hard for, something he has modeled and participated in, and something he has commended to all of those who bear his name. And that is authentic community. Dealing in a healthy way with conflict is founded upon an authentic community. And that's what they had been working on. And it took diligence, and it took time, and it took a lot of forgiveness and grace. But this is something they were working on. And as we talked about last week, one of the best ways to mourn in a healthy way is to have a community, an authentic community, that will help you to do that. And so we talked about what is an authentic community. An authentic community is a place that is built upon honesty, vulnerability, and faith. Those three things are crucial. Those are the things that have already been established the night that Jesus has this confrontation with his disciples. And so he tells them the truth. You'll notice that this is actually the Thursday of the week, and there was a conflict that happened the night before where they were at a dinner, and a woman came, and she was worshiping Jesus with a very expensive jar of nard or oil, and she was anointing him, and Judas especially was offended at that. He thought it was vulgar, the waste, the ostentatiousness of this display. And he says why it's upsetting to him. He says, we could have fed so many poor people. Now, sure, Jesus was all about feeding poor, hungry people. Did it repeatedly. Thousands of them. All about feeding them. And in fact, he had said to his disciples, including Judas, feed these people. And so Judas is still in that mindset going, we're supposed to be feeding people. That was an asset that we could have used to feed people. And when he brings it up, Jesus says, leave her alone. Leave her alone. Now, Jesus knows that her act is an act of worship. And Jesus knows that what is happening, it will be poignant. But here and now, Judas and some of the others are looking at it going, this is a waste. Since when did Jesus become all about worship of himself? Well, things were changing since they came into Jerusalem. And so already there's conflict there. What they had been told, what they had seen and witnessed before, and what they knew of Jesus didn't seem to be consistent. And so all of a sudden Jesus is saying and doing and accepting new things, and they're not sure what to do with this. The response would have been to come and say, you know, I'm still having a hard time with what happened last night. I'm having a hard time. But here we are almost 24 hours later, and that has not happened. And so Jesus initiates. And that's the first thing that happens when there's conflict. You cannot run from it. You have to address it. And Jesus does. He is gathered with these people in this community in a time of worship and fellowship and food. And he decides right then and there to lay his cards on the table and to tell them what is wrong. And he begins with that horrible statement that we all cringe at on Holy Week, where he says that one of you will betray me. Now, Jesus, being the embodiment of God, the incarnation of God Almighty, already knows what has happened with Judas. He already knows that Judas has 
put together the workings to betray him, has already spoken to the religious authorities and done his work in order to hand Jesus over because he has now become disillusioned with who Jesus is. And so Jesus is recognizing this and he's naming it, you're going to betray me. And they all become very upset at this because nobody likes to be accused. They all become really disoriented by this. It can't be me, can it? I mean, the first thing we like to do is deny. It can't be me. And Jesus goes, it's the one who's dipped their hand in the bowl with me. But here's the kicker. They've all dipped their hand in that bowl. They've all been eating at the same table in the same bowl with the same bread. They've all been there. Any one of them could be the one. Now, we know because this is 2022 and we've been reading the Bible for a while, we know that it's Judas. But Jesus points out that Judas doesn't act alone. There are others who will betray him before the night is over. And so Jesus is being very honest and forthcoming. Here is my problem. One of you is going to betray me. And then when Peter and the others start going, well, I, absolutely not. Not me. Everybody else will fail you, Lord, but not me. you got to appreciate his confidence. But Peter ends up saying, it's not going to be me. And Jesus goes, yeah, you too. Before the cock crows let us know the sun has risen, you too will have betrayed me. You will have denied me three times. And so that authenticity is so important The fact that Jesus can be radically honest with them. The fact that Jesus can be vulnerable. Can you imagine being Jesus, knowing what is coming? Knowing that you're going to be betrayed by one of your inner circle. Knowing the incredible humiliation and the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual pain that you're about to confront even before they put you on the cross. And then knowing that that is going to be the way that you're going to die. Taking this time to confront this. And some of us would go, well, you know what? It was a meal. It was really kind of rude to have this discussion at dinner. But really, Jesus is telling them, we need to resolve this now. And then the next thing that happens is that Jesus makes sure that he doesn't run away. He makes sure that he stays put to have the next part of the conversation. The next part of the conversation is there can still be grace because he immediately follows up his assertion that he's going to be betrayed with the institution of Holy Communion. He immediately goes into, here is how you can taste God's grace. And he gives it to them. This is my body. And then he takes that cup and he blesses it and he gives it to him. He says, this is my body. A new covenant of forgiveness. And so Jesus lets all of them know right then, in his own vulnerability, that grace is still available. That I am willing to forgive And I am willing to be reconciled because you are more important to me than my own pain and suffering. And so he turns that over to them. And then we have the next part. And this is the hard part for Christians because sometimes when we are going through something really hard, whether it's in the church or not, sometimes we feel this desire to withdraw, right? To stay safe in our homes or to stay away from people. But you'll notice that here in the scriptures, Jesus is really sure, to attend to his spiritual practices. They sing a hymn. They've prayed together. They've broken the bread together, which is their custom. It was part of their religious work for Passover. And then when they go back out, and they go back out to the Mount of Olives, Jesus is letting them know again, this is why this is happening. He's staying very rational. One of the greatest things... One of, there are many greatest things to me, but one of the greatest things about Methodism is that Methodism values your ability to reason. It values that. In fact, it's so valuable that it's one of the four things that we utilize to spiritually reflect and come up with our own answers in theology in conjunction with scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And so reason is really important. And Jesus stays rational. This is why this is happening. There is a prophecy, human sin is a thing, and this is what is going to happen, but he goes on to assure them that he's not going to abandon them just because they desert him. And even though Peter continues to cling to his assertion that he will never betray Jesus, I will die with you if I must, but I will not betray you. 
And the others are echoing this sentiment. And then we stopped. Because the work isn't done. But the scene will become interrupted very quickly. But the work will still have to continue because there's no resolution. And the fact is that Jesus is going to pick up on this after he's resurrected. He's going to come back to Peter and talk about, remember those three times? Let's talk about those. Let's make sure. Because you cannot have authentic community if you're not willing to address the issues that are causing pain and suffering. You cannot have authentic community if you're willing to bury conflict and not work through it and not address it. And so Jesus, even though he's probably really glad to be resurrected and on the other side of Good Friday and the cross, even though Peter has stayed the course now, having been one of the first to experience the resurrection and the empty tomb, even though Peter is there leading the apostles in their work, Jesus says we still have to come back and work through this. Conflict has to be dealt with. You cannot run forever. And how many of us know what it's like to run until it just bites you like a vicious little chihuahua? It bites you. And you know, the thing is, my chihuahua's teeth aren't very long. They're short, right? They're like little itty-bitty little needles. And while they're not going to, you know, threaten your livelihood if you get bitten by her, it hurts. It stings. And that's what conflict does. It hurts and it stings and it nestles itself in your being and it will eat away at you. It will just slowly but surely eat at you. And as Christians, we can't do what we need to do and be who we need to be if we are totally immersed in conflict. We've got to figure out how to work through it. And we've got to figure out how to do it here if we're ever going to help do it there. And so the work begins, but it begins inside. It's an internal thing. Jesus stays grounded in reason. He doesn't get vicious. He doesn't get personal. He doesn't in any way, shape, or form strike back at them. And if you've ever been in a conflict with somebody and they start to get dirty, they start to talk about things and do things that have nothing to do with the actual conflict, then you know the difference in what Jesus is doing. He stays completely reasonable. He stays grounded in who he is and what he is here for. And he stays connected to them through that authentic community. He wants to make sure that they are doing the work together. And it's not easy. I can't imagine if you were putting together the top three things that you had to do before you died, that confronting somebody would be one of them. Now, I've heard people who are confronting their mortality talk about being reconciled with someone, forgiving someone, or, or working through that relationship so the relationship was good, but usually confrontation is not the word that they use. But you have to confront the conflict. Now, how you confront that conflict is whether or not you are embodying Jesus Christ. If you decide to use conflict to justify causing someone else pain and suffering, then you have not done the Christ-like thing. Jesus never does that. Never in this does he seek to cause pain and suffering. Instead, he seeks to bring about reconciliation. And he isn't trying to embarrass people. He's trying to make sure that we work through this. And the two who are in conflict with him by the end of the night, Judas and Peter, will deal with this in different ways. Judas will become so overwhelmed by his failure and the consequences that he will take his own life so that there can be no resolution to the conflict on this side of this life. But Peter, Peter does the Christian thing. And I know that sounds kind of weird because if you're talking about Peter and Jesus, we would clearly go with Jesus as being the Christian. But Peter hangs in there. He's working through it. He's struggling with it. And then that realization. If you continue with the story and you get to the third crowing of the cock and you realize that when that rooster lets loose that sound, that's when it clicks with Peter. And he's like, oh my gosh, I have done it. I have betrayed my Lord. I did betray him. And there's that realization and there's the wrestling. 
What does he do now? Jesus already knew it was coming. Does he sweep it under the rug? Does he, what does he do? And there's a pause in that because he will not have access to Jesus again until Jesus is resurrected. It's not until Christ comes in resurrected form to Peter that he has the opportunity to have a dialogue. And Jesus makes sure that they do. So when you have a conflict, you have to cling to and embody the very same things that establish the community in which conflict can be resolved. You must remain honest. Honest about what you did, honest what they did, honest about who you are and who we're called to be. And you must strive to be vulnerable. You can't deal with conflict if you're not going to be open and honest about how it makes you feel or how it impacted you. And Jesus does that in a very eloquent way. And then the last part is your faith. Having been vulnerable and honest about the betrayal, Jesus closes with a hymn enters into what we would call the sacrament of Holy Communion. Jesus makes sure that God is very much manifested in the community. Sometimes when we don't know what to do, we go back to what we always knew how to do. Ironically, Peter will do the same thing. Well, uh, that was really traumatic when they crucified my Lord and um, not really sure now. Let's go back to fishing. And Jesus shows up on the beach. So we do, we have this default. We will go back into the patterns and to the comfort that we have in our lives. We will go back there. But God is not calling you to go back there. God is calling you forward. Jesus foreshadows this and says, the day will come when I will drink of this fruit of the vine with you in my Father's kingdom. Reminding them, no matter what happens in the days ahead, we know who we are and we know where we're going. Amen. Stay that course. Stay that course. But it was never about going alone. It was about going together. And perhaps one of the most illuminating things that we don't really talk about, because let's be honest, Judas makes us all uncomfortable. For a number of reasons, Judas makes us uncomfortable. Perhaps one is none of us ever want to think of ourselves as Judas. Makes us very uncomfortable. But if you continue through the gospel accounts and you get into the book of the Acts of the Apostles, what you find is that they realize that they're, they are broken. There's only 11 of them now. And Christ is resurrected and, and Christ is ascended and they've got to fix that. They recognize that they were called to be complete. They were called to have 12. And so they set about trying to prayerfully discern who should be the next, who should be the next into their leadership community, who needs to be next as an apostle. And what we end up finding is that they go with two. It takes two to replace Judas. Because when they lost him, they lost a lot of experience. They lost someone with whom they had been bonded, someone with whom they had been authentic and vulnerable someone with whom they had established their faith. And it will take more to bring that back into the community. And it's a long process for them. And if you've ever heard anyone say, well, I can forgive, but I'll never forget. I think that's probably fair. As rational people, we probably don't forget. Jesus didn't forget. Jesus did not forget what Peter did. But Jesus also didn't forget the promise of communion is grace. Jesus didn't forget that the promise of being one of Jesus' first disciples was a community that was founded upon faith and forgiveness and love and the reconciliation. And it's a hard process. It's hard for Peter. I almost wish you could see it, right? Because I... I feel very certain that if we could see that moment on the beach where Jesus decides to have the conversation with Peter and he says, you know, do you love me? And he says it three times. And you can see Peter like, this is very uncomfortable. And not in a like, men don't talk about love kind of thing. But in a, this is really uncomfortable, Lord, because I see what you're doing. 
Three times I denied you. Three times you asked me if I love you. And maybe, maybe if we could see Peter, we could see ourselves. And that hesitancy, the way in which sometimes you can work yourself up mentally and spiritually and emotionally and physically to get ready to do the good work. And then all of a sudden you're there and you want to pull back. But Jesus wouldn't let him. And then Jesus shows him, we have work to do. If you love me, then you will feed my lambs. And it's like Peter finally goes, yeah, you know what? That we can do. We can do that. We can bless other people because we have done this hard work. We can feed the hungry. We can nourish their bodies and their minds and their spirits because we have done the difficult work. We have dealt with our conflict. And perhaps the most important thing is that when Jesus ascends and leaves this earth in that way, Peter has the comfort of knowing that they addressed that conflict and they worked through it. And when Christ ascended, they were in a place where when they meet again, they can truly raise their cups and celebrate. We need to live our lives and deal with conflict in a Christian way so that when that day comes for us, we can all raise our cups with Christ. And it's not easy. I know that. But it is what is right and what is good. And so we will do that work. We will do it, and as we do it, we will reaffirm the community. A community that prides itself on doing the difficult work so that we can be honest, vulnerable, and faithful. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. It is now the time in our service where we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And as we do that, it's appropriate for us to also lift up to the Lord our prayers. And Jesus said, if you have a conflict with one of your siblings in faith or in reality, then it's appropriate to lay that at the altar. So may we use this time not only to worship the Lord with our gifts, but also to consider what we need to turn over to God in prayer. Let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Lord, may we worship you with all that we are and all that we have, that these gifts that are meant to bring honor and glory and to recognize your principal place in our lives and our hearts and in our minds might become a building place for those who struggle to know that they are yours, that they too can be forgiven and free. So we pray, Lord, that through the work of the Holy Spirit and the hands and the feet of the disciples of Jesus Christ, that these gifts will build your kingdom here and further pave the way for those to enter into that kingdom to come and share an unending feast and worship with you. May it be so.
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I have a few quick announcements to share with you. The first is that we're really excited about a new mission partnership we're beginning. So it's called Seville Sock Love, and we're going to start this October. The organization was started by Lindsay and Lily Simpson, two Charlottesville students who attend First United Methodist Church in Charlottesville. And they are collecting socks, and they distribute them through a variety of partner organizations throughout Central Virginia. And we'll be collecting new socks. They do have to be new. New socks for, in all sizes. Fun ones for hospitalized kids, basic socks for our neighbors in need. Although, do not neglect more vintage people without, without their good socks. In fact, the lay leader, um, the previous lay leader of the Virginia Annual Conference is known for his socks. Uh, he likes to take a picture every day when he goes to worship at Williamsburg UMC of his socks in the pew. So uh, do not neglect socks. Everybody gets their socks. Throughout October, there will be bins in the back of the fellowship hall. We'll have some place up here, too, that you can do that, as well as in the middle school youth group. So if you're able to participate in this, we would love for you to join us in supporting this worthy cause starting October 2nd. And then our Grace Grocery is our food mission here. We're hoping to collect any unused calendars that members of our congregation have received from local organizations. Sometimes they get mailed to you. If you receive a calendar and you don't want to put it to use, please bring it to worship or drop it off at the church office, and we'll get them to our clients at Grace Grocery. Also, they're looking for drivers for deliveries on Tuesday mornings. It takes about an hour each week for pickup and to deliver the food to the Meadows, which is the community that's down the road here, that way. Reach out to Diana via the email on the screen to volunteer, or you can check in with the church office, and we'll get you headed in the right direction. And then if you have any office needs, a request, a question, or something that you specifically need, please feel free to contact Bart. Uh, he is absolutely happy to help you with that. Communications at crozetunitedmethodist.org. Um, you can also call the church office, and we'll be happy to help you as well. The United Methodist Women in Faith have that yard sale coming up October 1st. They still have some vendor slots available. If you're interested, please reach out to Judy. We have her contact information, and we'll be happy to connect you with her as well. And then Bart would like to come up and make an announcement about our middle school. I need to get you a microphone. I don't need the stool. Okay. Probably. Okay, uh, if you check out the screen, uh, you can see this was a uh, middle school record uh, setting night. Uh, and we wanted to recognize a few kids who set some new records. Um, first, Lucas uh, set a new group record for moving marshmallows with one hand with chopsticks. Uh, 67 mini marshmallows in 30 seconds. <laughs> Benny flipped an Eggo waffle uh, 61 times in one minute, which is ridiculous. Uh, also, four group members, uh, Lila Mae, Jackson, Catherine, and Lee, uh, tied for the group record in wall sits uh, with a time of 20 minutes. It went on forever. Um, Sam Adley and uh, Camden set a new record for cup stacking with six full stacks and resets in 30 seconds. And uh, it, Emmy set a new record for participating in the most record setting attempts. So uh, we, we had a really fun night. Um, and I, I would challenge any of you, anyone in the congregation that would like to challenge any of these records or try and break them, please let me know. Uh, we can set up a time. Um, it, it would be strange, but we'll do it. Um, it. Anyway, middle school youth group's having a blast right now. Children's Fellowship Group is back in a big way, too. Like, if you've got kids or you know kids or you want to send them our way, uh, we would love to have them. Um, and as you can see, we give out awards with fancy certificates, like real certificates. Um, so pretty exciting stuff, and uh, we'd love to have you involved anytime. I don't know why there was a pyramid that was built. That, everything got chaotic at the end. Anyway, thank you guys so much. Um, and it, like I said, if you know a kid that would like to be involved, please send them our way. Thank you. It's very biblical, Bart, for things to get chaotic in the end. <laughs> Fif 61 flips of an of a Eggo waffle? I think I consumed 61 in a minute when I was great with child, but I don't know if I could flip them. All right, but I hope that you'll, you'll consider that. Um, by the way, we're always welcoming adults that want to come and just be those chaperones, and you can certainly witness this and experience this amazing group, so we commend that to you. But we are grateful for all the things that are happening here at our church and for all the people that are a part of that. So as we close out our worship this morning, let us stand as we are able. We're going to sing together, God of Wonders.
with peace, knowing that the Prince of Peace is with you and for you, that no matter what conflict awaits you this day or in the days ahead, Christ is with you, and may you respond in a way that reveals to others that you are with Christ. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. Amen. One, two, three, two, three. Our wonders beyond our galaxy. You are 